My name is Dr. Stephen Cohen. Uh, I'm in private practice as a plastic surgeon in La Jolla, California, and I'm a clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego. What I'd like to talk about is a outstanding seminar series brought to you by FATS, the Forum for Adipose Tissue and Stem Cells. This is going to be a forum of multiple seminars over August this year, which focuses on all aspects of regenerative medicine and its application to skin treatments. This is an ideal course for dermatologists, plastic surgeons, aesthetic medicine practitioners to learn the state of the art of regenerative facial surgery and treatments from the leading faculty in the world. We hope very much you'll join us this August at our series of seminars. Look forward to seeing you then. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar from different regions of the world. My name is Christine, and I'm your hostess for virtual courses from the Forum of Adipose Tissue and Stem Cell, or better known as FETS. As you are familiar, FETS is an academic facilitator that has functioned as the driving force behind a number of high-profile conferences in South, uh, Southeast Asia since 2009. We provide an academic platform to better understand the significance and uses of stem cell science in both aesthetics as well as regenerative medicine. With great honor, our founder, Mr. Eddie Liu tonight is here with us. May we have him on the screen to welcome everyone, please. Hi, dear esteemed doctors, uh, a very warm uh, welcome to all of you from around the world. My name is uh, Eddie Liu, founder of FATS, a forum of adipose tissue and stem cells. FATS was founded in 2009. We serve as a dedicated educational platform in the field of regenerative medicine and surgery. For the past 12 years, FATS have hosted many renowned experts from all around the world on our annual FATS Bangkok on-site conference. Tonight, we are very honored to host the first series of facial regenerative surgery deconstructed webinar which comprise of a total of four webinars starting today till the end of September 2021. You can log on www.fats.my for more information of the rest of the webinar series. I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Stephen R. Cohen from San Diego, USA, for lecturing the first webinar entitled The Fundamental of Facial Regenerative Surgery and Dr. Kamo Watanakrai from Bangkok, Thailand as the session moderator. Hope you all will be happy and enjoy tonight's session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eddie. Tonight, we from FATS working hand in hand with Dr. Steve Cohen, a world-renowned plastic surgeon, the inventor of ITR2 technique, whom has received four Professor of the Year Award, including in the year of 2020. We are proud to bring you a four-part webinar to discover the latest updates in facial regenerative procedures. So with all pleasure, we are presenting to you the very first lecture from our Facial Regenerative Surgery Deconstructed Series with the title, The Fundamental of Facial Regenerative Surgery, moderated by Dr. Kamo Watanakrai and presented by none other than Dr. Steve Cohen. So in this webinar, we are going to discuss about facial aging and the changes in the soft tissues and bones with aging. Dr. Cohen is also going to present the anatomy of the facial fat compartments and demonstrate the new standardized technique of anatomic and regenerative fat grafting. Following tonight's introductory lecture, we have also prepared three other very exciting consecutive virtual sessions around facial regenerative procedures presented by an impressive panel of internationally recognized faculty led by Dr. Steve Cohen. So the second session following tonight is going on the 29th of August. The third one will be on the 5th of September, while the last session of the full series will be on the 26th of September. We'll be sharing a little bit more details on each of these webinars later towards the end. For tonight, 
We have a series of really exciting agenda lining up for you, which also includes an exclusive promotion for our upcoming facial regenerative surgery deconstructed courses. It is therefore really important to stay with us through the entire session, ladies and gentlemen. So just a little housekeeping before we get started with our lecture. If you have any question during the presentation, please type them into the question box um, in your Zoom control panel. So look around your screen. You should be able to locate a Q&A button either at the bottom or on top right of your screen, depending on what gadget you are joining this webinar with. We will compile them and bring them up after the presentation dedicated for all your questions. So now allow me to introduce Associate Professor Dr. Kamal Watanakrai, our key moderator today. Associate Professor Dr. Kamal Watanakrai is a board certified plastic surgeon. Currently, he is the immediate past president of the Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery of Thailand, National Secre Secretary of ISAPS, Board of Directors of the Rhinoplasty Society of Asia, and Director of Bangkok Skin Plastic Surgery Center. His practice involves all aesthetic plastic surgery in the facial area with main focus on eyelid surgery, nose, facial lipoplasty and rejuvenation. He has published multiple articles in high quality plastic surgery journals and book chapters. He has also traveled many countries as international speaker for congresses and teaching courses. Without further ado, Dr. Kamo, ladies and gentlemen. Over to you, Dr. Kamo. Thank you, Christine, for your kind introduction. I'm pleased to moderate this interesting session presented by my friend, Dr. Stephen Cohen from USA. For me, uh, Steve should be a role model for young plastic surgeons who want success in aesthetic surgery. Long time ago, we recognized Dr. Stephen Cohen as a famous craniofacial surgeon. He published many articles in, aesthetic, in craniofacial surgery, and he also invented and patented the intraoral dissection device Nowadays, he involved more in aesthetic surgery. He then became a famous aesthetic surgeon, as you see on the slide. He popularized the new concept of fat grafting technique we call the ITR, injectable tissue replacement that you will see later. His successful career can support the concept of our plastic surgery training that to be a successful aesthetic surgeon, you need to have a solid background in reconstructive surgery. So before we start, I would like to remind the audience that you should use the Q&A uh, button and then you can ask the question and we ask him later on when he finished his slide. So Steve, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Cohen. So I want to talk about regenerative strategies and facial rejuvenation. And I want to try to provide evidence that these are effective because they seem to be very effective. And as we begin to look for the proper outcomes, we begin to see that they're more effective in some areas than we even expected. For instance, especially on their excellent effects on the skin. Uh, my disclosures will not affect my talk. Uh, I like to try to always put what I'm doing in the context of a overview. And so to me, when I treat patients, and I think irregardless of background, whether you're um, Asian or whether you are Caucasian or whether you are any different ethnic background, whether you're pink, gray, or blue, all of us age with three major findings. And this is what brings people into our offices, sun damage, volume loss, laxity. And these present in different fashions based on genetics. Um, they're superimposed on genetics, facilitated by facial expression and internal and external environment. Uh, when, you know, when, when mothers have, um, give their children hats to wear, they know they're protecting them against the sun. And these are things that every patient comes in with and every device and every surgery and every treatment is aimed at. That's really, to me, the whole story of facial aging. Now, the other thing that's important in my mind is to recognize that really aging occurs from the skin down or from, from the bone up. So it's important to not only think about and evaluate 
aging in different components and different tissues, but also to devise treatments because these treatments all facilitate the improvement or the reduction of aging and, and possibly in a very legitimate way, not just as an aesthetic improvement. So again, I've always ascribed to team care to treat all major entities, sun damage, volume loss, laxity, facial movement. I think it's important to work with people who have that expertise. Now, let me just digress to a different subject briefly. The difference between biologic and chronological age. I think we all recognize that we can't control any, any age for anybody, okay? We're gonna age time-wise no matter what, but we can control how we age. We can eliminate stress in our life. We can, we can diet properly. We can have the luck of having good genes. And as we develop therapies, whether it's systemic therapies or local therapies, we'd have the ability to actually measure these outcomes by looking now at various effects on the human genome. And we have biologic markers or we have meaningful markers of aging that allow us to test different drugs, for instance, or different techniques like ITR squared on actually cell health and cell age. So right now, how do we reverse aging? How are we younger? By our diet, by reducing and eliminating stress, by exercise, with hopefully our genetics, and also understanding when we're born, what's gonna happen? Because now we have the sophistication to know somebody's <laughs> going to heart disease. And we have pharmaceuticals perhaps that can stave this off, and we're evaluating more and more and regenerative approaches. So questions that I like to ask, because this is what we really want to do for our patients. And this is what our patients really in their heart, not only wanna look more youthful, but they truly wanna make sure can they actually delay or reverse their facial aging? Not just cosmetically, but on the cell level as well. So as we think about aging in the context of growth development and trophism for 22 years and a gradual decline coming into our offices with sun damage, volume loss, laxity, we begin to think about how can we change this curve of decay? Because that's what's happening. And what's happening is skin is developing a chronic inflammatory reaction to the sun and we're blunting our reedy pegs and we're losing our vasculature and our collagen is abnormal and our elastin becomes overabundant uh, and our youthful skin structure begins to change even on the cellular level. This becomes particularly important because as the skin barrier breaks down, systemic diseases can occur from an enormous amount of surface area. So it's important to know what happens to the skin, sub-Q fat and bone as we age, because then we can potentially develop a better theory of addressing this, not just, oh, I have a new laser, I have a new technique, but understanding how these new techniques and lasers fit into the overall treatment strategies of truly improving appearance and reducing the rate of aging. So you take this woman who's very subtly aging from 2011 to 2017, and maybe is desiring fillers in certain areas around her face. Can we diagnose the anatomic locations of this fat loss that's occurring, the bone loss that's occurring and restore it in a meaningful way that not only improves the appearance, but reverses these changes. So this is what we're really looking at. And by understanding the anatomy of the superficial fat pads and the deep fat pads, we can begin to actually look at the topography of the face and understand which particular fat pads are degenerating, where is the bone degeneration? We can, again, target these areas. So anatomy is always critical. What about facial ligaments? Well, to my understanding with facial ligaments, we think they stretch, but I think it's more like when we lose weight, our belt does not stretch, it looks larger. So I think the ligaments become slack because of the relative deficiency in fat that develops. The only ligaments that stretch are the premasseteric ligaments, 
and that allows the jowling to occur as the face falls outward and down and begins to accentuate the jowls. That, in my opinion, should be repositioned if needed. But again, always think sun damage, volume loss, laxity. So if we're treating our patients non-surgically, I think the same way. I say, what am I going to target for laxity? Am I going to use old therapy? Am I going to use threads? What am I going to target for sun damage? To what extent and what type of laser do I need to begin to employ? Or is this patient still very youthful and just needs IPL? And to what extent will I target volume loss? Will I use biologically active fillers or will I begin to resort to these regenerative approaches? And again, as we understand what happens in the deep compartments and in the bone, we begin to develop strategies such as ITR squared to try to meaningfully address these. Now, one thing to remember is when the bone expands and enlarges as it does around the orbits and reduction in the, max, in the maxilla and enlargement of the piriform and the nasal cavity and reduction of the dimensions of the lower jaw, it leaves behind the skin. So if we can, again, uh, develop techniques that prevent this bone loss, we also begin to prolong our, the effects of aging on the tissue. Now, what about the skeleton? And what about the soft tissue changes that occur from age? Look at this particular woman. Now, this is not the same patient, but it's very similar. So this is a 19-year-old and, and the same patient at 54 in a lateral cephalogram and look at the lip and nose with just aging. So when you start to see these kinds of things dynamically, you begin to go, well, gosh, you know, we do Lafort ones, we cut the jaw, move it forward, it moves the nose right back up, it protrudes the lip. So can we devise strategies with injections in the piriform area that raise the base and Kaya-Meller injections that raise the tip and again, develop techniques that allow us to treat some of the nasal aging that we've never even really identified other than to say our nose gets bigger as we get older. So the history of fat grafting is an old one. And if we have time, I'd like to delve more into what fat grafting really is and update you on the science of this. But Nuber was first to employ fat grafting in, 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 in the 1800s. It wasn't until 1998 that Sid Coleman standardized the technique. Now this technique was standardized using micrographs, but injected throughout the face based on aesthetic judgment. And that's fine, but it's not anatomically precise. And not that there's anything wrong with this, but I think our understanding of fillers, our knowledge in surgery makes it such that we should really become anatomically precise. It's not very hard. Uh, if I can do it honestly, most people can do it. So right now, for the surgeon or the surgical dermatologist or the, aesthet the aesthetic medicine doctor that does these kinds of procedures, fat is like clay. We put it wherever it looks pretty and it looks nice. And then we complain that it's variable because to some extent it is variable, just like we're variable. Now we're using our DNA. There's a reason that the variability occurs one on a scientific basis because only a small amount of the fat survives in this outer zone when injected. Most of it dies in the inner zone, but this middle zone has stem cells which are more resistant to low oxygen tension. These live and replenish the process. So basically fat grafting largely is associated with dead tissue that dies, gets cleared out, and then tissue or fat that's regenerated from the lot from the stem cells that survive and the small rim of outside fat that also survives. Now, I wanna return again to the anatomy of the face because this is to me critical. As we understand anatomy, everything becomes clearer. The, the magic of surgery, the magic of our treatments begin to appear. So understanding that superficial fat which is primarily there to support skin health is above the muscle and deep fat is below the muscle. And actually there's more fat in the superficial planes than in the deep planes, about 56% to 44%, something along those lines. 
And again, we can look very clearly on a woman like this. We can see the retaining ligaments of the face and that structure, how lateral to these, there's very little skin movement. Medial to these, there's a lot of skin movement as the deep fat deflates. And as the reedy pegs and the other fibroceptal network begins to relax, especially in the areas that are mobile, such as these non-true ligaments along the premasseteric area. And you can begin to evaluate very specifically the losses in the deep medial fat that correspond to this, the losses in the medial and the lateral sooth that correspond to these. You begin to see the buccal fat losses that correspond to this area and even the temporal losses. And you begin to go, oh, if I can treat these and reevaluate these, can I restore actually not only the anatomic improvements, but the youth by regenerating tissue? Now let's think about the fat compartments again. They're arranged differently below the muscle. They're not very tightly clustered. They're big billowy, billowy clouds like the buccal fat pad. Above the muscle, it's tightly clustered like a cobblestone street. Again, this is organized superficially to support the health of the dermis. So we're constantly producing adipose stem cells that produce new dermal fibroblasts. The deep fat is there for cushioning of, of, of the muscles, but also protecting the nerves and our vasculature. Now, always important to understand anatomy from a safety point of view. When we're injecting the nose, the plane of these vessels are in the SMAS layer. So if you're superficial or if you're preperiosteal, things are safe. And if you glide along the layers rather than push and force things, you're very safe. And the same thing in the area around the supertrochlear and the supraorbital. This area is the most dangerous. Contrary to fillers where we're worrying about everywhere on the face, which is an important thing, these areas with fat grafting have been associated with, with the, the rare and fortunately rare cases of blindness that have occurred. So very important. And I like to actually use local anesthesia in this area prior to my injection, just to create a little spasm in those vessels. The other thing that anatomy teaches us, if we look at a, at, at a segment like this, is look at the lower lid. There's no fat. There's the abicularis and there's the skin and dermis. The fat begins below the abicularis. So this is superficial fat. Here's our deep fat, okay? So this is important again to recognize anatomy because this tells us we shouldn't be putting any fat in the lower eyelid because the only fat in the lower eyelid is intraorbital fat that causes that protrusion. Now, what about the cells that are in fat? These were identified in the early 2000s. And basically, if we eliminate the fat and we keep only the cellular content, this is considered the stromal vascular fraction. And what this is composed of are stromal cells such as preadipocytes, tissue macrophages, small amounts of stem, and stem cells and fibroblasts, and vascular cells. And of this population, the stem cells account for 1%, but that's an enormous number, 500,000 per milliliter, in contrast to bone marrow where there are only 5,000 per milliliter. And these cells are in the drapery around the adipocytes. They're in the they're around the blood vessels that run in the matrix of the supporting network around the adipocytes. They cling with covalent bonds to the blood vessels. So in the past, it was thought an enzyme would need to shake these loose. We know now that there are many new mechanical techniques that we're using. And interesting, when we implant this fat, and the stromal vascular fraction, we get very predictable effects of some of the growth factors that we can assay. And you can see again, it's a mixed bag of cells. The stem cells are a small percentage. If we want only stem cells, they have to be grown in culture. But what they bring with them are numerous other 
growth factors, platelet-derived growth factors, cytokines, chemokines, transcription factors. And these are the things that work magic. So now what about definitions? Nanofat has become very popular in a word. And this is really a marketing term. And it's a cute term and it's a good term, but because it indicates that this is a type of mechanically produced SVF small enough to inject in a 27 gauge needle. But different devices produce different quantities of cells in nanofat. Now, mechanical stromal vascular fraction has also been referred to as stromal vascular tissue. So these are things, and again, important to understand that different devices do different things, but the benefits of using stromal vascular fraction, stromal vascular tissue, nanofat, whatever you might like to call some of these are production of blood vessels, collagen and elastin remodeling, and immune modulation. This led to concepts very early on where we were applying mesotherapy in studies in Hong Kong in 2008, 2007, because it made sense that if we delivered something that would improve the immune system of our skin, the blood supply of our skin, it would make our skin more youthful. And we also began to use this with mesotherapy techniques to burn scars and other kinds of wounds. And we noticed that they would lighten considerably, they would soften. There was some degree of scar reversal as new blood supply came in. And you could see, for instance, in this small Korean study where only a million cells were injected twice to the periorbital region. And you can see the changes in the skin quality and the, and, and the reduction in wrinkling. So you begin to think of fat, not just for augmentation and appearance changes and replacement, but as a drug delivery almost, where we're putting these cells in for skin support and tissue health. And what's interesting and anecdotally, you know, this is a, the first case of a woman injected with stem cell assisted fat. This is in 2003, I think. And this woman six years later came in my office. And at first I really didn't appreciate what a substantial change had occurred, even in these ridids around the perioral region where we didn't inject these. We only injected the lips and the nasolabial folds. But if you look, the whole area became more youthful and persisted for six years. Here again, just the nasolabial folds and lips injected, but the whole region looks like, almost like a wilting flower. And then you put a little water in and the flower wakes up. It's just beautiful, but subtle and hard to measure. Same thing with the changes in pigment. These were becoming more and more uniform changes that we noticed, but they were subtle changes that were hard to detect. Now you could detect them on biopsy quite easily because this was a study out of Brazil where cell uh, enriched fat was utilized prior to a facelift and biopsies were obtained three months later. And you could see almost reversal of age related changes in the skin. So a lot of stuff I've published and others have published, and this is accumulating to a point that finally physicians are understanding that these are valuable therapies. In my field in plastic surgery, we've been a little slow to adopt, although we've had many of the leaders in the field come out of plastic surgery, you know, the, the, the large number of people are still kind of up in the air because they can't quite measure these things. Now, again, microneedling becomes very appealing to the dermatologist or the aesthetic medicine physician or the plastic surgeon because this is one way of introducing these cells such as nanofat or SVF into the dermis. And these microneedles have to be about 1.5 millimeters in length in order to deliver properly these, this tissue. And you can see for us at the end of every case, after we've done our fat injection, if we've done a facelift or eyelids, we then microneedle the entire face, the, the chest and the neck. The other thing that we do is we compound our nanofat into a gel and mix it with lipoderm. Lipoderm is a liposomal transport agent that binds smaller 
growth factors, probably exosomes, any substance less than 5,500 Daltons. And this delivers it through the skin. So this is a real deal. And when we did a study with lasers, just using this topical cream for three days after treatment, these patients had significant improvement in wrinkles, texture, and nasally labial fold reduction. This was published in the Aesthetic Surgery Journal. So uh, my experience has been vast with fractional lasers. And again, the benefit of creating a hole is you can do drug delivery or cell delivery. So let me just show you a couple little things that we're doing with our fat grafting. So, you, you know, we want to treat the whole area. So when we're doing around the eyelids, we're treating the cheek, the deep fat, the piriform, which we've treated first. We're going into the deeper aspects of the malar fat pad. Here we're in the junction between the medial and lateral sooth, just above the periosteum, okay? So that's my first step. Now, if I want to elevate the brow, you can see I've been able to elevate that by putting droplets of fat just under the tail of the brow because, again, this is not a two-dimensional drapery that falls down. This is a three-dimensional structure that gradually is losing volume. In the upper eyelid, I like to put this, again, against the periosteum. I have my fingers on superorbital and supertrochlear as I first aspirate and then very carefully inject. And you always glide in these areas. And once we finish these few steps, as you'll see, because this is a comprehensive treatment. Here, I never put fat in the eyelid. This fat, which is micro fat, is being placed in micro droplets just in the superficial aspects of the fat pad in this area, which you saw in that dissection, okay? Nothing goes, no fat, other than nanofat, which is a cell product. So there's no structure to nanofat. It can't be used for augmentation. So I'm placing nanofat in the lower eyelid and the tear trough as a stimulatory device. There is not, even though you see a little augmentation effect from the liquid of the injection, this is a cell injection. There's no fat ever placed in the lower eyelid. And once this is completed, we move on to the next step because we've now done our millifat for structure, our microfat for superficial, and now we're gonna treat the entire skin surface with microneedling. In this case, we're using a roller, but I like the stamper better. And then once this is completed, the patient is sent home with the bio cream and that is kind of the general treatment. Or if you take a patient like this who has multiple ridids and sun damage to the neck, we're using in her case a fractional CO2 repair laser. We've harvested fat while the laser was done. And now we're gonna replace the subcutaneous tissue or fat loss with micro fat throughout the neck, just through the entire planes. Once we finish that, We're going to use nano fat in the deep ridids with a 27 gauge needle. This is something called a cell brush. So it allows you to, uh, with your thumb, dial this in. Then we're going to do the surface with our micro needling because we're treating all layers and we're delivering cells appropriately. And this is, again, another way of treating patients fairly non operatively. So, so let me just look at my time. All right, I'm gonna skip this for, because we don't have time for it, but we've been able to show that we're able to demonstrate uh, significant changes just using the topical cream in concert with lasers. And now, again, this is a very simple that... technique because what we're doing is simply taking the fat can be harvested from a knee, you know, or each knee with a 10 cc syringe. So we're putting a little bit of tumescent fluid. I'm comfortable enough to have my physician assistant do this. It's a very simple surgery. The fractional laser is being done at the same time. 
The skin has been harvested, turned into nanofat, compounded into a biocream. Arnica, lipoderm are added, and it's applied immediately after the treatment while the, while the injury holes are still open. You can see her immediately after treatment. And what's interesting with this approach is when we compared 85 patients that had no nanofat to 35 patients that had nanofat, we had improvement of one up to almost three points in a five point Likert scale. And you can see improvement in virtually every skin type and across wrinkles, nasolabial fold depth and texture, which was a surprise because you don't expect these findings to be dramatic when it's a three day application. The other thing we noted, this is a very light skinned woman. She's prone to, hype, uh, to, to redness. This is the side that was treated with the laser only. This is a punch biopsy from a week earlier. Here's the side that was treated with the laser and the cream. Here's the punch biopsy. And you get almost four to five times the new elastin being laid down in a short period of three to six months. So fat grafting can do a lot. This woman, the only treatment other than a perioral fractional laser was full facial fat grafting. And look at the restoration of volume and the effect even on laxity, because now we're treating volume anatomically and we're seeing the reversal of at least the volume effects. And then we can treat the laxity differently. So this is a long-winded introduction into the foundations of this concept, which are precise diagnosis of all areas of volume loss from skin thinning to superficial and deep fat compartment losses areas of bone loss and pre-existing skeletal deficiencies, recognition of different anatomic clustering and arrangements of the superficial and deep fat. And so what we do is we make three fat graphs. We've devised a little device I'll show you called LipoCube. And we make from the harvest cannula whole size of two millimeters, a, mi a milli fat. We just clean it with Ringer's lactate. From the little cube, we make micro fat and a cell enriched nano fat. And these products are then used to treat the patient. Um, nano fat can be grafted, but again, there's no augmentation effect. It's just simply into the tissue. And Sophie Menke will show you, she's an, she's an aesthetic doctor, will show you how widespread grafting into the skin produces a reduction in skin aging. SNF is a technique that Alex Verpelli, and I'm, I know that he'll show this in the uh, advanced course where he's injecting subdermally with a 27 gauge needle. I showed you the nanofat microneedling, the nanofat biocream. All of these can be used simultaneously. So when we treat our patients, we put millifat into <clears throat> the deep compartments, areas of bone loss, microfat into areas of superficial loss, and nanofat for regenerative purposes. Now, this is the device that's most commonly used either as a non-disposable or disposable, and it consists of a 400 and 600 micron screen. And this allows you to emulsify the fat into a nanofat product. But in using a filter, we trap fibrous tissue. And I showed you earlier the fibrous tissue, the matrix is the niche the cells live in. So in this device, we get a cell poor nanofat. So we devised something where we took this cube, we harvest the fat with a two millimeter syringe. I, I'm sorry, whole cannula. So that's our millifat. Now we're gonna make microfat from the millifat. So we're gonna put this into port one and we're gonna put an empty syringe in port two the interface is going to cut this fat down to one millimeter. So now we have micro fat. Now we're going to make our nano fat. So again, we're going to start with our milli fat in port one. We're going to cut this down to one millimeter. There's a cutting screen or right inside here, but this cuts doesn't filter. Now we're going to emulsify this by changing the dial to a tunnel, a one millimeter tunnel, and we go back and forth 10 times. 
This smooths the product. So emulsification and cutting are being done to separate cells. And now we're gonna change this to a 500 micron interface. And this cutting screen will deliver a cell optimized nanofat. And then these three products can be used for structure, superficial replacement and stimulation. And when we compare what comes out of this nano cube to the tulip device, we get almost twice the number of cells at the same basic viability. And when we grow this, we were able to correlate that we get substantially more culture growth at seven days from the competitor and other kinds of different expressions of adenosine genes and mRNA. So for a woman like this, a single session of this approach is going to give beautiful results. However, for a woman like this, who's already had two traditional fat grafting sessions, we probably need something more. So nanofat alone is still a relatively cell poor type of, 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 of fat, even though it has more regenerative cells. So when we need more regenerative cells for hostile tissue beds or for, for large massive fat transfers or for more regenerative effects, we wanna go after our stem cells and we wanna get as many of these as possible. So we wanna get a very high content of SVF. And if we're able to do that, clearly we're gonna have more effectiveness. This is a study out of the Lancet where they bolus fat or they added uh, bolus fat with stem and regenerative cells. And what they found was in, the, in, in those that were regenerative, about an 85% survival compared to a 16% survival when no cells were added. We think this is effective. The problem has been it's expensive. The enzymes have not been well accepted in most countries. Uh, it requires expert personnel or an expensive device in most cases. And collagenase has been a problem. And most methods either incorporate separation or emulsification. And that's why we're doing both. Now, what we've developed is another cube approach where we take two cubes and we use this in conjunction with a centrifuge. And we're now able by combining a three-step mechanical digestion method. And I'm not gonna, I don't, you've seen these, the way these things work. So again, what now what we're gonna do out of these two cubes, we're gonna spin this in a centrifuge and the, we've developed a little gasket at the bottom of the syringe, which is, you can see it's, it's, it's con, con, concave, not convex. So it captures these cells because these cells stick to plastic adherent and then fill up. So the SVF is at the bottom in this black little cup, okay? And we're gonna get rid of everything above except the Buffy coat. So if we keep the cells in this little cup and the Buffy coat, and we combine those two, we now get the same number of cells that we can get from an enzyme. And we don't have any problem other than no IV use. So now we have a cell yield by taking the cells in the, in the cell adhesive gasket, combining them with the Buffy coat, we get the same number of cells that we would get if we used an enzyme. And this is in comparing this concept to Cytori's, which still is the gold standard for the number of cells and the proper cell population. So we term this hybrid SVF, okay? And this has been published in Cell uh, and we have new publications pending. So again, when we're injecting, we always have to be cognizant of safety. Um, the injection techniques are relatively simple, but again, aging is very dynamic and you can begin to see first, we wanna inject the deep fat into the deep sections through 18 gauge needle punctures. These can be hidden at the juncture of the nose in an Asian patient. 
put into the hairline. So, you know, the limited number of pokes that leave perhaps a little bit longer red dot. And then, sorry, above goes the micro fat and lastly, the nano fat. So that's the general concept. And when we start to look at patients and we treat them, such as this woman who had a micro facelift, in her case, we're using the fat injection afterwards, but I prefer to do the, the fat and then do the facelift. But look at the brow go up as we fill this. And we're gonna fill the forehead with micro fat and the lips with structural milli fat but around the perioral region, which we did a fractional laser on, this is micro fat and it's going in the subcutaneous area, just like new carpeting. You know, we're just putting it in throughout the subcutaneous fat because that's the area that needs to be replaced. And then as I say, micro needling the rest of the face. I showed you this earlier. And again, very precisely, it's just as easy to inject the cheek precisely as it is to inject it aesthetically. So piriform, then deep medial fat, and then sliding up to the medial sooth, the lateral sooth, and the deep malar fat pad. And that will handle the entire cheek anatomically. When we have patients like this that require buccal fat replacement, we do it either intraorally This patient's awake, a little needle puncture, our fat graft. But what's interesting, our fat graft, sorry about that. And look at the effect on the skin surface by anatomically addressing the issue in this lady, you'll see in a sec. So you can see one side hasn't been treated, the side that's been treated, but anatomically precise. Because if you put that fat above the muscle, it doesn't belong there. And if they gain 10, 15 pounds, that's when some of these really ugly looking fat graft cases come out because they're placed aesthetically, but not anatomically. The simplest way of going into the buccal space is through the same needle puncture that you fill the lips you just tunnel submucosally, and now you're in the buccal fat. And we showed you some of these techniques earlier. Here's the sniff technique, using a lipo pen and injecting directly subdermal into the wrinkle line with this little computerized device that can either develop droplets or threads, and then where does the facelift fit in? We don't have time for that today, but just to show you where we think that this fits in is when you have laxity, we like to reposition this with deep planes. Excellent lecture, Steve. You show us a, a deep insight of the aging process and facial anatomy. Uh, we are waiting for questions. Should I just begin to answer some of the questions, Eddie? Yes, okay. Uh, uh, there's a first question like they asked you about it. Can you see the question? Yes, okay. So uh, they, they added, is there any press where facelift is necessary? Yes, so, you know, again, in and out, in 45 minutes, it's hard to convey all the information, but absolutely. When you have excessive laxity that can't be corrected by an energy-based device, then a facelift is necessary. So when most patients, you know, when they're older, require fat grafting and facelifts and lasers. What I, the point I'd like, was trying to make was that every patient that comes into the office has sun damage, volume loss, laxity. Whether mm -hmm. they're 30 years old and it's very subtle or whether they're 70 years old and it's more pronounced. So if we select devices and treatments based on the degree of laxity, the degree of volume loss, et cetera, and we start to think regeneratively, i.e. it's not a single laser treatment. They're coming in all the time for lasers to clean their skin and facilitate what the skin naturally does. And they're coming in periodically 
for volume restoration, but in this case, regenerative volume restoration. And when they lose more in four years or for somebody else in two years or for somebody else, maybe not at all, they're coming in for another treatment. And as their laxity progresses and can't be treated by energy-based devices, then we start to look for different types of facelifts at the same time that we do the fat grafts. Okay, thank you. The second, second question we asked for your secret. How do you make the nano fat bio cream? Okay, so the bio secret bio is cream, very, bio dip, yeah. <laughs> yes. the secret is very simple. If you have a pharmacy that has lipoderm, lipoderm is a very common compounding agent. You know, dermatologists will compound things like arnica with lipoderm. We do the same thing because the lipoderm will take small particles and transport them through water soluble tissue like the skin. So if you just put something like nanofat on the skin surface without any injury, you're not gonna really move that tissue into the skin. So in order to do that, you either have to microneedle it like I showed you or combinations of microneedling and then making the bio cream. So what we do is we spin the nano fat, it becomes like a gel. We take out the clear fluid mm -hmm. and we then mix it half and half with that lipoderm that if your pharmacy has lipoderm, you just say, do you have 2% lipoderm? Yes. And then we mix it and we send the patient home with that, tell them to put it in the refrigerator, use it till it's gone. And we add arnica so that it doesn't smell like, you know, tissue. And, you know, they just use it twice a day, three times a day until it's gone. And we've been able to show statistically significant differences in healing in these, in these patients having laser. And then as part of our overall treatment, what's been very interesting is in under age 55, these patients show evidence of trophism, meaning their facial volume is better two years later even though they've had no weight gain. Okay, uh, the next question may be easy for you. He asked for any special technique to easy for fat to easy ejection because you use an, uh, your like Q something. So the, yes, the, the, the way that this is done is it's easy because it is simple. It, and again, I say that because if I can do it, anybody can do it with just a little bit of training. And what's involved is harvesting the fat. We make a little needle puncture, so no incision. We, we harvest with a cannula. The whole size of the cannula is about two millimeters. Mm -hmm. That determines our first product. And then we use the, the, the little lipo cube or the nano cube to make micro fat and nano fat. And then we, we put these fat products in based on the anatomy of the patient. So if a patient has losses in deep fat, the deep fat is put in, losses in superficial fat, we use the micro fat product and then always for the whole face, um, the regenerative product with the nano fat. But again, if one is only trying to get skin regeneration, well, the only product you might need is nanofat. Maybe you combine it with your fillers, you use it with your lasers. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, if somebody's not comfortable doing fat grafting as they are and they're comfortable with fillers, this can be done in combination. But the filler is more of an inert substance and the nanofat is going to regenerate tissue. Mm -hmm. So, okay. The other question is the same about the, net, the cream. So we skip that. So do they ask for uh, any special cannula you use? So special. yes. So the can again, any, any, I, for my millifat, my more structure, I use an 18 gauge cannula. It's, it's blunt and it has a side port, not an end port injection. And for my microfat, I use a 18 gauge cannula. And for our nano fat, if I'm using a cannula at all, it's 20 gauge, but I also use a 27 gauge needle and the micro needling device, which is called the Hydra needle that can be purchased from Alibaba or a variety of different groups, very inexpensive. Next one about the ultrasound. Do you use the razor? 
I, I, uh, I do use VASER, but I also use ultrasound guidance. So I use a little device called Clarius because Clarius, you can see what layer you're in. So if you wanna be super safe around the face, you, you can inject with ultrasound guidance, but yes, I use VASER all the time. And VASER doesn't, if, if the energy le level is 60 or below, it doesn't kill the cells. So VASER very effective for skin tightening, for pre-treatment of the fat to make it easier to take out. And, and if you're using the VASER setting of 60 or less, the mm -hmm. cells remain very viable. And that's been published. The next one asked for your opinion about the first lift. And he said, uh, first lift will be not, no, but will not be used anymore, I think. Do you don't agree? Are you agree that the first lift okay. is not necessary now? Well, let me tell you, here's my thought. If somebody comes in at age, in, okay, I mean, I, Asians are delayed because you have a little bit better sun protection and your parents say, wear a hat, don't go out in the sun. But let's say you're Caucasian and you live in California and you're 29 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, you're smiling all the time. You look at your mother and father, you see what they look like. They have lots of wrinkles here. They have deep lines here. Once a year, start doing Botox. You start to see slight changes, a little redness in the skin, some brown pigmentation. Start using IPL or the next thing, collagen genesis. You start seeing more progressive changes. You get them to come in on a regular basis with laser care, skin care. They're on the right products. And now when they start to see enough decline that they notice in more than two areas, facial hollowing. So they come in and they go, oh, my, I'm hollow under my eyes. My nasolabial folds are deep. My cheek is, I'm losing volume. I have temper. Well, it's because they're losing their fat. So that's the patient that I will recommend putting all of this back in. And what happens is it begins to change their decay curve. Now, does it prevent laxity? That's a good question. But I think if these kinds of treatments with lasers and regenerative approaches are started early, at early signs, not when it already happens, then yes, maybe we will delay the need for facelifts or maybe we won't need them. I, I don't know. But I certainly think we should be doing everything we can to avoid complex surgery. It's no different than you know, if you need a stent versus open heart surgery, all of us want a stent if everything's equal. Now that said, we're increasingly finding that for certain things like left anterior descending, it's better to do an internal mammary because you live longer. So even though stents work for reducing symptoms, maybe they don't prolong life. And I think it's gonna be the same thing. There's still gonna be a place for facelifts in patients that decline more rapidly and, and are more prone to develop more laxity. So the next one, maybe you already uh, talked in your lecture, you asked about your advantage of your uh, lipo Q over the conventional one of savings transfer. You so want to emphasize again, it's better. I think it's better than the cell collection, right? Well, here's the thing, the, the, the nano cube is, is, is really nice if you compare it to tulips, if you want nano fat and you compare it to tulip nano fat, mm -hmm. you're gonna see other techniques that people do where they're just doing fat grafting for augmentation. And they're using and saying, oh yes, the fat has a regenerative approach. My approach is really to, do, to think of it as different products. So to augment areas that have been lost and then to take nano fat and in this case, what we know when we look at our nanocube and compare it to the most common product on the market, which is Tulip, we get more cells. And we all know that more cells, just like PRP, the more cells you have, the more effective these approaches are, period. So that's why we use this nanocube. And if we want even more cells, we use the lipocube. So in patients that have really hostile tissue environments, have failed fat grafting, say for reconstructive purposes, maybe radiation injuries to their face, 
we move on to that lipo cube. So the next basic question, how to avoid central necrosis when you inject? The basic one, maybe you can skip or not. You, are they talking about how to avoid the central necrosis in the yeah. fat graft? Mm -hmm. you, you can't, that's part of the graft. In other words, it's, impo it's impossible to get 100% take of these grafts because some of it is gonna die. The only way to get 100% is to transfer it as like, like an omental free flap, you know, where you're transferring the fat with its attached blood supply. Otherwise you're gonna go through a progression where you, you lose some of the fat. But again, if you're under 55, you're gonna have a rebound effect because the stem cells begin to really produce new fat. If you're over 55, gradually things trail off. So at two years, about 30% retention. If you're under 55, at two years, more like 80%. So I think it's, it, it, it just depends on the age of the cells that you're using as well as these techniques. Uh, I think he, he asked for how to avoid a central necrosis to optimum volume, right? So you want to you want to obviously place small quantities uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and into the host environment. So the technical aspects are important, but assuming that let's say everybody does everything technically appropriately, still the fat is going to die because not all of it will get a blood supply initially. Stem cells are going to replace the dead fat, and you're going to get to some degree these regenerative effects in everyone to some degree. But again, if I use my cells and my cells are old and don't work and don't produce growth factors anymore, and we use Kamal cells because they're much younger and his work, he's gonna have a better result and it's gonna last longer than mine. Okay, needed oh, a lot of questions. So all three questions, uh, following three questions are the same about your Popular bio cream can <laughs> use without any uh, applied alone, without any uh, ablative uh, fractional laser or needling yes. something. Yeah, you can do. You can, you know, what you can do is you can even do just micro needling and then apply the cream and mm -hmm. send them home with the cream, or you can apply the cream. You know, you can use it also on the hair. You know. And you may, you may improve some of the hair growth, again, because you're delivering the cells to deeper layers. And the cream will work on its own, you know, because it'll go through the skin. I think it's a lot of questions now. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of questions right now. <laughs> I see yeah. one, what is the longevity of the results? Um, I have followed patients, um, it, can I can I put up my slides to answer this question, or is that going to be too much too much of a hassle? Mm -hmm. okay. no, you, you can you can, Doctor Steve. Go okay. ahead. Okay, and in the, because of because of the amount of the questions that we have in the Q and A box, you can screen through after a while just to see which are those that you think is important to address during this period of time. Okay. Right. Well, I, first, in terms of longevity of the results, um, this is a good question. We have studied our patients now for two years looking at the volumetric effects, okay? And we've also done some questionnaires to patients looking at the, you know, what they perceive are the effects on their skin. The, these things can last a long time. I'd like to just show you really quickly a couple of examples. So let me just go back for one sec. Let me see if I can minimize this. I'm just going to hold on one sec. I'm going to share my screen one more time. Can you see that? Do you see my screen? Okay, yes, none of yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, I want to just go through. So someone asked about in conjunction with facelifts. So most of our patients were doing the nano fat in conjunction with our facelifts if they need a facelift. Okay. So 
treatment plan for this woman with facelift, okay? Treatment plan for this woman with facelift. Same thing here and here. These are all with facelifts at the same time, but I want to show the, the results without. Now, if we do these facelifts with the fat graft, and you can see the results are lovely. Here's what happens. We get about a 50% improvement in facial volume. And at seven to 12 months, it goes down to about 30%. By the end of two years, with no weight change, it comes up to 73%. So this is a glimpse of what happens to the fat graph. Now, if I go and I start treating patients who are younger that come in requesting more than one filler under her eyes and the temple and the nasolabial folds, and I treat the whole face, deep fat, superficial micro fat, nano fat microneedling, nano fat installation, here's what this patient looks like a year later. So I'm not changing her appearance, I'm making her tissues more healthy. I'm reversing her back to where she was. Another patient, same kind of thing. How long do these last? Depends on your age and the health of your tissue. But what you see is these things do last and in some cases they improve. Now, if we take patients under 55, this is what happens. We get nearly a 60% improvement in mid facial volume goes down to about 20% here almost comes up to 80%. Again, in older patients trails off to 30%. And if we look at these curves, we're getting this rebound effect, I think, because as the, as the stem cells begin to reproduce the new cells, as the blood supply improves and the tissue becomes hardier, we see more volume effects. So we actually see changes in how people decay. So it's a complex answer to your question, but the reality is we're seeing improvement at two years in patients under 55. So the longevity, we don't know yet, but it could be that it lasts quite some time and it could be that it, it, it goes away a little faster in patients that are either older because we have older tissue or patients that are unfortunately not given the blessings of long life and good health to their tissue. Um, when rejuvenating the skin with nanofat, would I still use lasers for further treatment? Absolutely. Again, once people make commitments to improving and keeping their appearance looking good, you want them in the office three or four times a year for lasers. It's like car detailing. You know, if you're gonna drive around, the car's gonna get dirty. If you're gonna be in the sun, the skin is gonna need care. So you begin to educate people. These are not one-time treatments that you come into the office and zap and you're all better for the rest of your life. These are treatments that are like going to a skin gym. You have to come in all the time if you want things to look really good. And you do this along the way in, 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 a, in a way that you can afford. So there are still quite a lot of questions in the question. Dr. Koha, would you like to still take in maybe another two questions? And then, because sure, quite a lot of these questions will be covered in the following webinars in depth. Let me do that. Um, okay. Complications. Sadly, complications can happen. The one that's most feared of is blindness. Um, we are working right now with the task force through the International Society of Regenerative Plastic Surgery um, to make recommendations and should have a paper coming out for that soon. Lumpiness, I've not seen. You know, again, if you, you're not, you shouldn't put fat in the lower eyelid, you know, for cosmetics because there is no fat there. So the only thing for the lower eyelid is to stimulate the tissue and to put the fat in, you know, in the other areas that will influence the appearance of the lower eyelid. 
So lumpiness has not been a problem, but that's why it's important. For instance, if you're treating hollowing in the face and you put the fat superficial, then you can have problems with lumpiness because one, the fat is not really superficial in that location or you've put in too big of a cluster. So that's why I was trying to emphasize in the deep fat compartments, more structure superficially, more like a, a micro product or nano fat. And one more question, I think, let's see. Um, where do we get the micro needle for nano fat? That's a good, um, if you Google Hydra, H-Y-D-R-A, Hydra needle, that's, you, you'll come up with a bunch of different locations. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it on um, Alibaba. So it should be no problem to find um, that micro needle. And if you have issues, contact Eddie and Eddie will get, contact me and we'll give you that information. I think, um, I think I'll take one last question, two last questions, and then I think we can stop if that's okay. But uh, do I wash the fat? Yes, I wash it with a little Ringer's lactate uh, before I use it. Um, and just to eliminate the tumescent fluid, I don't use pure graft anymore because there's been no proof that it, in, in, that it improves graft take and it's just an added expense. So we just wash the fat with Ringer's lactate after we harvest it, just to eliminate the tumescent fluid. Um, do I use PRP? Yes, oftentimes we will use PRP in combination when we do, we usually do it as a 20% PRP to 80% fat mixture, or my preference is just to do the PRP after I finish the fat grafting, not to mix the two or dilute the fat with it, but simply to use it at the end, but kind of like in an 80%, 20% fashion. I think that should cover most of these, and we very much appreciate you attending. I will tell you that you know we give courses and Eddie has courses coming up and eventually when we're all live again, we hope we can show these wonderful kinds of approaches to you. Uh, and we hope that you'll attend these future sessions to learn more about how you can deliver these kinds of simple things. And I really tried to stay away from the facelift and stuff because if you use nano fat alone in combination with your lasers or with microneedling or because you have an odd wound or somebody comes in with psoriasis, it's even worth trying these things because of the wound, the immune modulation effects. This is to me the way to start to think about this. And I think when you see Sophie Menke's presentation, you'll agree that just stimulating the face with nano fat as one declines in combination with your current treatments may be all you need to do. Thanks again for attending. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Well, the sun is up at your site. Good morning again. <laughs> yes, now it's time to wake up. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. So there are really quite a number of questions that we're not able to address tonight, but not to worry. Like what Dr. Cohen has mentioned, we do have quite a, uh, we do have three more webinars, you know, they're gonna cover some of these questions in depth. So it looks like we're done with the Q&A session. Dr. Kamoy, Dr. Cohen, is there anything else that you wanted to cover before we move on to the next agenda of today's session? No, I just wanted to thank Eddie for um, his um, vision of helping to educate people throughout Asia and really throughout the world on these new techniques. It takes a long time for people to begin to accept these uh, and to understand the evidence is already there. It's much like treating cancer with immunotherapy. It's been 30 years and now people live with stage four lung cancer for 15 years, just living with their disease. So I think as we begin to realize applying these techniques early on are gonna be the most effective and being open-minded about it. And I, again, thank Eddie for bringing this kind of information uh, to a large number of people and allowing um, people like myself and the other speakers to uh, help share and educate 
uh, on these new topics. So thanks, Evie. Yeah. Thank you, Steve, for your wonderful lecture. And thanks for all the audience to attend this uh, wonderful uh, webinar series. Also, thanks for the facts to bring this uh, academic program to uh, our colleagues. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamor. So once again, thank you, Dr. Kamor. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Mm -hmm. Following tonight's lecture to the fundamental of the facial regenerative surgery, we at FATS are excited to showcase more interesting e-learning courses on facial regenerative uh, procedures. So as per highlighted in the very beginning, there are three more exciting virtual sessions presented by the panel of experts from different parts of the world, moderated by none other than Dr. Steve Cohen himself. So the second webinar after tonight is going to happen on the 29th of August on facial regeneration by Dr. Sophie Menkes from Switzerland and the cellular optimization of nanofat for facial regeneration by Dr. Anaretta Agovino from Italy. The third webinar will be on the 5th of September. Very interesting lecture on hair regeneration by Dr. John Peter Cole from USA and the clinical application of PRP, human follicle stem cells and new biotechnology in patients affected um, by androgenetic alopecia by Dr. Pietro Gentile from Italy. And last but not the least, the fourth webinar of the full series will be on the 26th of September on the advanced concept of fat grafting brought to you by Prof. Ling Tai Ming from Taiwan, Dr. Alexis Vapale from Belgium, and Dr. Tung Tiriaki from UK. Don't miss the opportunity to learn the latest updates from an extremely impressive group of experts in the world of regenerative surgery led by Dr. Steve Cohen. Now, each of these sessions is priced at US dollar 300. However, if you sign up for all three sessions, it will only be 499 US dollar, a saving up to 400 US dollar. Now, regarding the exclusive promotion that we have promised you at the very beginning of this webinar, starting from this second, exclusive for the first 50 signups only, we will be offering a buy one, free one full access pass for those who sign up for all three sessions at only 499 US dollar. So in other words, you are getting two full access passes to all the three facial regenerative surgery sessions for only 499 US dollar. So if you already are interested of going to any of these exciting facial regenerative surgery courses, our suggestion is to grab this fantastic deal now and probably find a buddy to go with tomorrow because with the lineup of program, we are very sure that there will be quite a number of doctors who are interested for this. So once again, each of this session is priced at 300 US dollar. Sign up for all three sessions at only 499 US dollar. And for the first 50 sign up, you get two full access passes to all three remaining in-depth sessions on the facial regenerative surgery deconstructed series only at 499 US dollar. So what are we waiting for? Hurry up. The sale starts at this very second. You will see the QR code, the promo link is being provided on the screen over here. So the QR code as well as the promo link is also being provided in the chat. You can also log on to our website at www.fats.mind slash facial regenerative to sign up now. So hurry up everyone, click on the link, scan the code or log on to our website and sign up right now. We do have, as the lecture was going just now, we, we do have a couple of um, doctors who have already signed up. Thank you very much for your interest and thank mm -hmm. you very much for signing up early. So for those of us who are still waiting, the seats are going fast, but we still have more to be grabbed. So act quickly, everyone. The special promotion link and QR code will also be sent exclusively to your email after this particular webinar. If you have missed the link and the code, you can still retrieve them from your email and purchase from there. Act quickly to secure your two passes at 499 US dollar only. So we have come to the end of this particular webinar. We hope that you have find this particular lecture to be educational, insightful and practical. There will be a short survey coming your way the moment you leave this particular webinar. And we really hope that you will take three minutes 
to just help us to improve ourselves to bring more value in your future learning with FETS. And with that, on behalf of FETS, we would like to say thank you for joining us today and see you on 29th of August. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening once again, ladies and gentlemen. What I'd like to talk about focuses on all aspects of regenerative medicine and its application. The state of the art in regenerative medicine. In skin rejuvenation, in the facial surgery and hair rejuvenation. Of the PRP, platelet rich plasma, human follicle stem cells and the new biotechnology in patients affected by androgenetic alopecia. Furthermore, we now have gene testing to help focus the best treatment options. How do we fine tune therapeutic options? How I do fat grafting and also the inventor of MEVCA. To do this, we need to know what has been done to enhance your outcomes, to offer more treatment options, and also to confidently manage complications in the easiest way. This is an ideal course for dermatologists, plastic surgeons, aesthetic medicine practitioners to learn the state of the art of regenerative facial surgery and treatments from the leading faculty in the world. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks to Dr. Steve Cohen and FATS, we are in for a real treat, which is the topic of hair regeneration. Dr. John Cole here from Atlanta and New York City in the USA. The medical stem cell and biologic for the prevention and treatment of hair loss has advanced significantly. Furthermore, we now have gene testing to help focus the best treatment options. The most important thing is to begin treatment as early as possible. Why is it so important to initiate treatment early? Tune into FATS to understand why and how. What works? What does not work? How do we fine tune therapeutic options? Why is regenerative medicine for hair loss such an essential adjunct to hair restoration surgery? We will review all these topics. Join us to discuss the latest in regenerative medicine for hair loss. Hello, dear colleagues and friends. My name is Anna Rita Govino. I am a plastic surgeon and also a PhD in regenerative surgery. I'm Italian and my education on regenerative surgery started with chronic wounds at Rome University, continued with burns in UK at Birmingham University while I was training in microsurgery in Romania. And then my regenerative focus turned from reconstruction to aesthetics with soft tissue rejuvenation following Tunch Tiriaki and Steve Cohen since 2014. My talk in the FATS course will be about cellular optimization of nanofat that is the way to maximize the SVOF cell yields and their viability and therefore optimizing their regenerative potential. Regenerative medicine and surgery are a new emerging interdisciplinary field of research and clinical application that is constantly growing and it is surprising us clinically every day. A lot has been done, but much more needs to be done in a non-stop evolution process to build the future medicine. So whatever is your field of interest and also specialty, whatever is the space you want to give to regenerative in your practice, it can be a strong ally to enhance your outcomes, to offer more treatment options, and also to confidently manage complication in the easiest way, aside from being part of the progress. To do this, we need to know what has been done and discovered so far, the state of the art in regenerative medicine, and this is what we will provide in this course. So join the webinar course of FATS virtual e-learning series and be part of our community of friends and colleagues. We need you to go further. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sophie Menkes. I'm an aesthetic physician and the medical director in Geneva, Switzerland. I am specialized in regenerative medicine, microfat, nanofat, and PRP, also in gynecology, aesthetic, and uh, functional. Uh, I would like to invite you to join us in the August at uh, FAT, the, the Forum of Adipose Tissue and uh, Stem Cell. It will be four webinars over this August with a great faculty. It will be very interesting. You will see all the aspects of regenerative uh, medicine with uh, very interesting clinical applications in skin rejuvenation, in the facial surgery and hair rejuvenation. 
so I will be very pleased to be with you. I'm uh, looking forward to seeing you again. I'm Dr. Chai Mining, a plastic surgeon in Taiwan. I'm an assistant professor of Kaohsiung Medical University and the director of Chaiming Institute of Aesthetic and Regenerative Surgery, CIUS. I'm working on fat wrapping and also the inventor of MEVGAM, a fat injector that fully executes my theory of micro autologous fat transplantation MEVT. Currently, I'm also one of the editor board members of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. On 26 September, I will be speaking at FED's webinar with Dr. Tang Teriyaki and the moderator Dr. Stephen Cohen. I will be sharing with you how I do fat grafting. Join us for the webinar and learn the advanced concepts. Good morning everyone, my name is Pietro Gentile. I am an associate professor of plastic and reconstructive surgery of the University of Rome Tor Vergata, Italy. It is a pleasure for me to participate in this very interesting meeting about the clinical application of PRP, platelet-rich plasma, human follicle stem cells, and new biotechnology in patients affected by androgenetic alopecia. During this meeting, it will be possible to analyze the uh, clinical, histological, and instrumental results obtained by the different uh, clinical application of PRP and human follicle stem cells in air loss. Uh, it will be a pleasure to stay with you during uh, this meeting. My name is Dr. Stephen Cohen. Uh, I'm in private practice as a plastic surgeon in La Jolla, California, and I'm a clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego. What I'd like to talk about is a outstanding seminar series brought to you by FATS, the Forum for Adipose Tissue and Stem Cells. This is gonna be a forum of multiple seminars over August this year, which focuses on all aspects of regenerative medicine and its application to skin treatments. This is an ideal course for dermatologists, plastic surgeons, aesthetic medicine practitioners to learn the state of the art of regenerative facial surgery and treatments from the leading faculty in the world. We hope very much you'll join us this August at our series of seminars. Look forward to seeing you then.